get connected with Take Two Radio on Facebook or Twitter at Take Two Radio. For email updates on future shows, follow at Blog Talk Radio. For previous episodes, upcoming guests, and more, visit Take2Radio.com. Hi, this is Dave Roundtree, co-author of the soon-to-be-released Demon Street USA, author of Paranormal Technology, an all-around science geek in the paranormal. And when I'm not doing anything, I sit around and chuckle to the antics of the Mallard Report. The opinions expressed on the Mallard Report are those of the hosts and participants and are not intended to and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of any simulcasting radio network or sponsor. All listeners are advised to make their own decisions. It's the Mallard Report. Yeah, the Mallard Report. The Paranormal Talk Radio Show with Jim Mallard as your host. See what lies beneath any paranormal activity. Go inside a world that others don't I want to thank everybody for talking or talking with me tonight. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for joining me tonight here on the Mallard Report. I'm your host, Jim Mallard. I want to thank SpectrumLight.com for provide, for sponsoring the show. Visit Spectrum, SpectrumState.com or follow them on Twitter at AU Paranormal. They provide the be- some of the best. I don't know. But they work great with Sony cameras, so check them out, SpectrumState.com. Tonight I have two guests, which is I kind of rare because we were just talking about this off air. Kind of gets a little dicey at times. People start talking over each other. That's okay. Once in a while, we've, we've got to make the, the bull jump. So here we go. Tonight I have Lillian Roberts and Sarah K. Miller. No. Sarah K. Sarah K. <laughs> there you got it. Yeah, close enough. Uh, well, I told you I was going to mess it up. I, I've listened to the video. You, you're probably wondering where all these bikes are, are coming from. You're t- you were talking about your dog, which is I, which is unfortunate. Are you still doing that, by the way? Selling selling autograph books for your dog? Yeah, I am actually. I uh, well, I mean, she isn't cured yet, so you know we're going to keep doing that. I've been uh, selling autograph copies of my three paperbacks and putting the profits toward my dog's cancer treatment. Okay. So how can people get one of those? I guess this should be my questions. Oh, um, yeah, off my website, sarahkajane.com, there's um, uh, tab Katie Care. That's the name of the page. And they can see a little video about, you know, what I'm doing and, um, what's going on with Katie. She's adorable. I highly recommend go watch the video. And you can just purchase it right off the website. All right. And and, and what's your website? I guess we should get that full. <laughs> yeah, sarahkajane.com, um, S-A-R-K-A-J-O-N-A-E.com. Thanks, Mom and Dad, for that name. I was going to say, how do they come up with that? Do you have any any clue? Oh, totally. Well, Serica is a very popular Czech name, and my family on my mother's side is, is all Czech. And my great-grandfather's name was John. So Serica was because that's like the Czech equivalent of Sarah, and then jean A was a feminized version of John. Well, we thank them for that tonight, I promise you. Um, <laughs> so, Lillian, do you have any uh, special, I don't want to use the word pet project, that sounds very inappropriate at this point, but stuff that you're doing like that? No. Okay. No. I so, do have two dogs, but I'm not doing that. I had two dogs. I only have one now. The other one passed away. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. So who wants to go first? It's about telling me about what their their books actually are about. Mine? Yeah, go ahead. So, since I was just talking, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, my books are about uh, immortals. So uh, basically, I have um, I started to write one book, and uh, um, by the time I was finished, I had eight. So it became a series, and it's called a Immortal Rapture series. And um, I was just uh, it's all about immortality because I've been 
absolutely fascinated with uh, human immortality ever since I was in college. So I knew that I most likely will never see that happen in my lifetime. So I decided to make it happen in my books. That's how I basically started. So um, I do have four books that they have been published so far. Um, there is a fifth one that should be coming uh, towards the end of the month. And then the remaining three will be published uh, quarterly. Well, uh, Mike, you, you just said you have eight books. Yes. I can't, I, you know, people tell me I should be trying to write one. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I'm, wrapping, I'm trying to wrap my head around writing eight, or even having the well, concept for eight. How does it... I started to write, like I said, one, and um, the basic thought that I had was um, to combine two people for from totally different worlds and one human, one immortal. It's not a vampire now. It's just a person that lives forever. So I started to write, and I was absolutely stunned to find out how all the other people, all the other characters in my book just fell in place. And I kept writing and writing and writing. And by the time I was finished, I had approximately 380,000 words. So, you know, I didn't want to uh, print a tome. I wanted a book. So uh, I think I was told it was about 80,000 words per book, 70 to 80,000. So it became eight books. <laughs> I, I'm st I, I just feel... I mean, I, I try to write a blog, and I'm lucky to get out <laughs> a paragraph and a half. So, obviously, obviously, you had a passion for it, and you had a good story, and you went to town with it. Yes. So, so uh, I, I sure did. So, are I these are, are these your first books? Yes. Um, actually, I started to write um, the Immortal Awakening when I was in college, and I did not finish it because, you know, getting married and having children and um, having a, a very demanding job, um, I couldn't spend all the time I wanted to, um, to the books. But later on, um, it became a lot easier, so I started to write, and from, like I said, from that one book, now I have a whole series. And I'm actually into the next book. There's going to be a standalone. I'm going to try to make it a standalone one book. That just baffles me. Okay, Sir, Sir no, <laughs> Miss Miller. You know, you can. Yes, you can just call me SJ. That's my nickname, Sir Jane. SJ. People call me that all the time. I love it. I think it's cute. Oh, good grief! I, thank your parents for me. Just for the record. Um. I'm assuming this, this writing process didn't happen the same way for you where you sat down and wrote eight books at one fell swoop. Oh, yeah, I just banged it out over a weekend. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Like, I, um, you know, I started with one book, and just like with Lillian, I started in college, and it took forever to get the first one, and I was, like, certain that I was just going to write this one. And the next thing I know, uh, you know, I've got the second one done and then the third one done, and I kind of felt that the three sort of wrapped it up, but I have so many other ideas and so many other stories that I'm writing like five books at once right now. So um, I hope to have eight books done someday, but um, I'm I'm still amazed that Lillian, Lillian's written that many. I mean, it's still, even though I've written three, it's still like eight? Really? Eight? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just impressed somebody has wrote one. Oh, wait, that's just based off my track record, so... <laughs> Well, the first one is always the hardest. It is it's always the hardest. It gets it does get easier after the first one for sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll take I'm taking your word for it. I keep scribbling stuff down on index cards, like I you know want to write about this. I, change, I can't even get that far, like what I want to write about yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
Now, now, Lillian, I, I caught this in your bio, and it kind of threw me for a loop. You're an engineer by trade? Yes. What kind of engineer? Electrical engineer. But actually, I don't do uh, what I studied in college. I work for a big corporation, and I, I'm a fiber optics engineer. So I have... Uh, uh, what I really do is uh, design jobs for the company that for uh, big corporations or even for uh, individuals, you know, just design jobs and then construction and installation takes the jobs and they install the fiber, provide service. So I've got to ask, because normally, you know, people are always, you know, studied English and that, but that's a great fa their passion. So has being an engineer helped you being a writer? Uh, being an engineer, you mean? Yeah. For no. studying that now. No, um, okay. Actually, that is all math, so it really had nothing to do with writing. The only thing that it did for me um, was the fact that, um, you know, I was involved in science, and um, that's when I started to really, um, I knew that scientists already were looking into the possibility of immortality, and they still are. It's just a question out there. And that's how I kind of became involved um, w with this immortality issue, and it gave me the idea of writing my book. So now I'm going to change the pace up on you two. How, how did you two come together? Because you don't necessarily, I mean, you wouldn't be together otherwise. So how did I get you two together? I would like we to actually, uh, we met <laughs> on Facebook and started just among different authors. And I ended up um, like telling her that I do publicity for authors. So it was a kind of a long story. She ended up like hiring me to publicize her first book, Ariel, A Mortal Awakening, and then I worked with her through the series. Um, then I got a book deal because I originally self-published. My publishing company hired me on as a book manager, and then I referred Lillian, and they started publishing the rest of her series. So we've known each other for a couple of years now, and, and we've we've gone quite a long ways from being you know two self-published authors who you know, didn't necessarily know exactly what they were doing to, you know, now both being with Booktrope, that's our publisher, they're great, and, um, you know, winning contests and putting out multiple books and, and lots of fun stuff. Yes. So being a, a book publicist, what would, you, what would your advice be for somebody that's starting out into self-publishing or however, either way, if they have a company or self-publishing or however you want to slide you know, it, it's great that we have this self-publishing option now. I mean, as a publicist, I work with self-published authors. And then, of course, as a company, I, I also work with um, what we call indie published authors, people who are at a, at a small publishing house, lots of personal attention. You know, it's not like a big, huge publisher, but it, they're still very different and, and both great options for, for someone who's like a first-time author and isn't sure which way to go. I mean, my advice really is if you're the type of author who wants a lot of control, who has a lot of time to do promotion, and who doesn't mind self-promotion, it's, it's a really good idea sometimes to start with self-publishing and just see kind of where it goes. You have a lot more freedom. But if you get a publisher, you've got all this support. Um, you don't have to pay anything out of pocket. You know, they'll, they'll do your cover. They'll do everything for you. You still have to do some of your own promotion, though. That's something that I always tell authors who are saying, oh, I think I'm ready to publish. I think I'm ready to publish. I say, okay, well, you need to resign yourself to the fact that no matter what, even if you get a publishing deal with, you know, a big, big publisher, they're still going to want you to do some promotion. So it's really just a matter of sitting down and being honest with yourself of, do I have a little bit of time to do promotion and then let a publisher do most of it? Do, or do I have the time to promote it myself, the money to put into 
getting a good editor and all that too. You you cannot skip that even if you're self published. And just really be honest with yourself. What do you what are you looking for? And then, you know, once you figure it out, just uh, you know, you have to go for it hundred percent. It is not something that will just kind of fall into your lap or you can just put something online and it'll just take off. You you, you need to be like full force, just I'm gonna make this happen. I, I totally agree with that whole sentiment that you have to make it happen because no, like it, that that rule applies to doing my show because if I waited for people to to hear my show and listen to my show instead of going out and knock well not proverbially the whole you know going out and knocking on doors or tweeting at people or all this other stuff that you have to do to get them to pay attention to you it's it's yeah. tough and that's something that a lot of people aren't comfortable with. You know, and as a publicist, I'm, I, you know, I tell people, look, if you're really not comfortable pushing your books, that's okay, but you're maybe going to need a publicist then because somebody needs to go out there knocking on doors and, and putting stuff on social media and, and, and being willing to just, um, you know, talk, talk, talk about your book and, and say how great it is. And if you're not willing to do that, you, you need someone who will. Exactly, and I think uh, it's really hard to be a self-published author. You have to incur a lot of expenses, and, you know, you have a lot of painful moments uh, when you want to find uh, some sort of a door to success, and somehow it's always shut, just like you said. So Mm -hmm. it's very, very difficult. My advice to uh, new writers would be, that they really need to have a publicist or an agent. It, it does help a whole lot. That's that's what I was just wondering. I was sitting here thinking, you know, you obviously you two have that connection. You have worked together. So, of course, yep. this may start to sound a little bit like a, you know, hire, hire her, but that's not what we're doing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. If if you take no. it that if you take it that way, take it that way, of course, because there's somebody out there. I that, mean, no matter what the disclaimer I put on it, will will say that's what I'm talking about. But right. And of course, the other hand is it's I don't just, have. It's just really a matter of your time, though. I mean, if you really think about it, do you have the time to spend promoting your book? Because it's at least a part time, it's not a full time job. And then when are you going to have time to write your next book? Because making a career, and that's my other main piece of advice to somebody, is you can't just write one book. You've got to write several books before you have any chance of really getting a career going. So that's your first priority is, 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 well, maybe if you have a family or if you have a day job, of course those have to come first. Then you have to find time to write your next book. If you have time left over, then maybe self-publishing is a viable option for you. But if you really don't, then trying to get a literary agent, trying to get a publisher is probably, you know, the only way you're, you're going to achieve any success. And that is going to require a lot of time up front, too, sending out a bunch of query letters and, and, you know, talking to smaller publishers. Sometimes you can submit straight to them. It's a big investment that is completely worth it. But just, you know, resign yourself to that so that you don't give up right before your break is about to happen. Right. So I, I now want to get a little nut and bolty into this. How I noticed, Lillian, you write in the romance thriller area. Some. So how do you stay yes. in genre, so to speak, when you're writing? Or does that come later? You write write it and then no. figure out what it is, or. No, actually, once you start and the thought that you have, uh, you first get you first. Um, the characters, and you sort of build your plot around those two characters. And for me, it has always been romance and paranormal. So I stay with it. Um, it's not really difficult. So it may be for others, but it's not for me. It is just uh, like um, Sarah was saying, trying to find time staying late at night and putting your thoughts together and stay within the the idea, the thought that you have and stay with it. Don't go outside that. I'm not sure. Everybody um, works differently. 
not every author thinks the same way so or writes the same way or um, you know creates uh, their thoughts the same way but that's how I stay with it so I've got a question for you since um my 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 main website is italkparanormal.com I've got to ask where do you draw your inspiration for paranormal type writing from well <laughs> <laughs> I sort of believe in that. I'm a firm believer of paranormal. So I have had a few personal experiences. And um, it's kind of difficult to speak um, about that. But it has to do with um, family members and my sister personally uh, who passed away. So... I am a firm believer. I do listen to your show. And <laughs> well, thank you. Hear. Well, thank you. And I'm sorry. I, well, thank you for listening. And I understand because those those stories can be deep and and well rooted within your soul and not something you are open to sharing. But I was just kind of curious because that always kind of you know being the nature of the beast. Yeah. I'm always curious about that. So you know, it is difficult to speak um, about those thoughts because um, many people do not think the same way. So some find it not being uh, real or uh, the experiences you have are just made up in your mind. So, you know, most people just sort of keep it to themselves. I know I keep a lot to myself. So I've told a few people, people that I know, but I don't tell, I don't sit here and write all my stories off every week, so I understand. True. Sure. So, CJ. I've had a couple of paranormal experiences as well, and I'll tell you, when I tell people about them, they think I'm crazy. And it, yes. it's hard because I think that's the reaction everyone gets, and so then nobody wants to talk about it anymore. That's exactly So, I mean, I, I was really lucky growing up in California, and then I went to college in New York, and I personally have found people are a lot more open-minded to that kind of stuff. You know, and people are, are more, um, you know, forward about that. And so it was easier for me to, to believe and to talk about it. But then I go other places and they're like, you saw a ghost? That's crazy. Ghosts don't exist. I'm like, really? Because there's so much, you know, so much that says that they do. But all right, you know, if you don't want to believe it, I'm not going to change your mind. <laughs> I, I love this. I, I love this because I was at a, don't my I run a paranormal investigation team. I went to a place that is supposed it's kind of active, but we went to approach the owner about investigating there, and for an hour, I don't believe this place is, but then had another story, and then would call another staff member over to tell us another story, but I don't believe it is here. But everybody, it seemed that <laughs> for an hour, there was probably five people that this owner called in to tell a story, but I don't believe them, you know, but they she called the next person, and it's like, but you know their stories, and you're telling us to listen to their, you know, it's like, okay. You know, you just I just sat there and listened and enjoyed the conversation. And, but, yeah, well, it's kind of One of the great things about fiction, you know, I mean, in fiction, like, you can talk about it and everybody accepts it, you know. So I think, I mean, that, that's a great avenue, like, for Lillian, writing paranormal, paranormal romances, especially in her first book. There's, there's a lot of that sort of activity, and everybody will read it and think, wow, that's really cool. And they'll, just for a moment, you know when they're reading it, they believe maybe it's possible. But then in real life, nobody wants to admit it. No, no one wants to even entertain the notion. Well, <laughs> I, now I'm going to head down the road of, now that you've got you've got her first book now, and you just, you just signed on to promote it, being paranormal, does that make it more difficult to promote for you or easier to promote for you? For me or for Sarka? For Sarka, because she's the promoting person. Right. But well, yeah, I mean, I guess for both of us, we both promote it. Um, no, not at all. People love paranormal. Paranormal is is really hot right now. You know, everybody's into ghosts and vampires and werewolves, and and you know that opens the way for mediums and psychics, and uh, that's uh, everybody is fascinated by it. You know, if you put it out there as as a nonfiction, that might be a little bit harder. But telling those kinds of stories. Um, it's very easy to promote. Everybody is really interested, and they love it. There's such an opportunity for being creative. You know, when I tell them, like Lillian brought up, that she has these great immortal characters, and they're not vampires, um, and they're not fae, you know, they're not fairies, and, and they're not anything exactly that you might 
have read something else that that really sparks people's interest. They're like, oh, really? So then, then, then what's her stories about? And then I can go in and explain the whole. You know, she's created this whole immortal mythology. You know, these whole characters that have been, you know, kind of secretly hiding in plain sight the whole time, and that that gets everybody's interest because they're like, hmm, maybe there really could be immortals hiding in plain sight. How would I know? It's it's fun. <laughs> I think I, th- I think it's fun, and I think it's fun talking about the the real end of it. People that are willing to share their stories, and sometimes you kind of go, even me being a believer, you go, I still don't believe that one. Yeah. So. They might not believe, but they might still find it entertaining. Yeah. So that's where you got that Yeah. It's not just a, 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 you know, immortality. It's also the romance. So it's something that mostly women, you know. <laughs> I I think it's the buyers are mostly women <laughs> on well, that side. But there are a few men that they love romance, so. Well, we, I've got to, got to learn somewhere. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because I've had several guys read my book, especially the first one, Between Boyfriends, and say, now I know how women think. I would never have read this book, but I am so glad I did because now I understand. And and so smart men, very savvy smart men, will read women's fiction and romances because it gives a lot of ideas, not just how women think, but what women want. So, definitely. Exactly. I had a British um, teacher who wrote me. He was reading the book um, on the train while going to work and back. And he was telling me that he learned now how to write romance from my books, which I found kind of cute for a, a teacher telling me that. So it's pretty nice. See, now you just now you just need to figure out how to market that idea to guys so they would buy your books more. I hope so, but I'm pretty happy with uh, you know the way they sell. Oh, but the, as, as as like I was saying, with being the show host, I can always use another hundred downloads, though. <laughs> oh, of course. Oh, I mean, within the next course. hour, that would be great. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, I actually have... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's... Uh, I was just saying yes. Yeah. <laughs> so go ahead. Go ahead. That, that idea of um, kind of marketing to men a little bit, now, I mean, we, we don't put a lot of time into that, but they're, they're actually, that is something that, that we've done a bit. I've, more so for my books than, than for Lillian's, but we've done that too a little bit of this sort of like, you want to know how, you know, women think, you want to know like maybe why you're not communicating well with women, and, you know, here, read this book and find out. Uh, I actually had a couple of college students do some Vine videos for, for my first book saying, oh, you know, I read this book and uh, now i got a girlfriend. Now I know, like, how to treat women. So, you know, you spread those around and, and then people sometimes go, well, you know, okay, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll check that out. So that's how you, you can actually use that strategy to promote the books because, I mean, what guy feels like they know everything about women? No, uh, not not this one. I can, I, I can only speak for me, but... <laughs> Actually, yeah, everyone can always use a little help. <laughs> you know, it's really funny because I have my wife on the show next week. Because actually Ooh. next week is our anniversary, so I said, what better anniversary present than book her on my show? Oh, great. Happy anniversary, <laughs> early. Thank you. Yes. So she's probably going to listen to this and go, yeah, he doesn't know anything about women, and next week I'll probably get laid out for even going anywhere near this topic. But... Um, <laughs> So, well, you mentioned Vine. I, I, I've i dabbled with it. I, I'm horrible at it. But is that a – how did that work for you? How did Vine work for you, I guess? Is, I'm just going to ask the question straight. Well, I mean, Vine videos are – I mean, they're perfect. I mean, they're super short. They're funny. They're easy to, you know, share on Twitter. And so they work really well because, you know, people have a short attention span. You give them a short little funny clip, and they're going to want to know more. What I've had really – good luck with um with mine is is having a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives doing almost like a, a little skit and we've actually gotten pretty creative having there's one um 
there's one where there's a girl and her boyfriend's like, I'm done with you, and like walks out, and she's like, oh, we're crying. And then her friend comes and goes, oh, between boyfriends, help me, and like tosses her the book. And everyone loves it. It's just this really cute little clip that everyone can relate to because, I mean, who hasn't been dumped? <laughs> I mean, everyone at least once. So that that's kind of, you know, it, it's sort of a, a little skit. And it works really well because people love going, oh, yeah, I, I totally relate to that. Like, that's happened to me before, too. It, well, it makes also, sense to I me. I just don't have the ideas for like it. Go ahead. What? Um, also, I think creating uh, short trailers on your books. They have helped me also because I can look on the trailer and look and see what the book is about in just a short time. So, and you can create those. Uh, I can create those by myself. So every time I um, publish a book, I do, um, I do one of those and put it on my Facebook and uh, you know, send it to my friends and things like that. So it does help. Yeah, I think, you know, they always say don't judge a book by its cover, but I think a lot of that does happen. Judge a book by its book trailer, your host cover. <laughs> At least give it 30 <laughs> seconds to convince you why you should read it. <laughs> you would be surprised, though, how many people, uh, including myself, will pick up a, a book because of the cover. Well, um, you would be surprised. I'm not surprised by anything. I mean, I, I host a, par <laughs> a paranormal show. I'm not surprised by anything. But but I, I think more often than not, people have to be excited or have a desire to go get the book, though, not just pick it up because of its cover. Yes. Yes. Well, what, it, what I've found, I mean, just, you know, a little from my publicity thing, the, the number one reason people buy a book, unless, of course, they've already read something by the author, the number one reason is from personal recommendations. You're never going to get something that, that's going to push someone to go and actually buy a book more than their friend telling them they love the book. So that's, you know, that's like the, the best way is to get people talking about your book. Um, after that, the reason most people buy books is from customer reviews. They don't care so much about, you know, what the New York Times has said or what USA Today said. Not that that's not great and not that I don't love editorial reviews. I mean, I do. But customer reviews, the ones just from your average person, are what people go off next besides personal recommendations. Anything that starts to, to give someone a sense of what a real person thinks about the book is going gonna, is gonna to get them to buy it more than the book description, more than the cover. The cover might catch their eye, but it's, it's the reviews that people really say are what got them from thinking, eh, maybe, to, yeah, i got to have this book. Makes sense to me. I mean, you got to have the the quality information out there. Word of mouth is the best way to, to do anything. I mean, because I can sit here and tell you I have the, I host the best show ever, but until somebody else tells you that, it's hard to believe. It is a little surprising, though. People think that people will give more weight to a professional review than a personal recommendation or a customer review, or that um, direct advertising might account for more sales. And, and of course, that helps too. But it, it's really, it's really that personal connection that somebody makes, even if you know it's close, even if it's just an online review. It still feels like your friend is telling you, just, oh yeah, I liked it, and this is why. But I, it is surprising to some people because you know they're like, oh well, you know, what do they know? It's like, well, they're the reader; they're the ones who really know if it's a good book or not. Yes, you do have to have a whole lot of reviews. Some of them may not be that great, and some of them may be great. You have to learn to to know that your book may not be everyone's cup of tea. So once you go with that, you have no issues. This is about the point in the show where I always implore people, especially now we're in this topic, to if you buy one of their books or you listen to the podcast or whatever you do, just take a minute, especially when it's, a smaller person or a smaller author or whatever, give them the time to write a review, even if you hated the book or loved the book or or blah, about the book. Just let them yeah. get the feedback so they know for the next time. Because it sounds like both these, these ladies are writing, again, or still, I don't know, I almost said again, but it sounds like you've been going through that, and that's going to lead me to my next point. But 
Yeah, it's an ongoing process, and if you don't tell somebody, they don't know and don't grow. So, anyways, exactly. kicks, and, the, kicks the soapbox right. away. Go ahead. And it's up, up to us, too, as the author, to say, um, of course, all feedback is valuable, but you have to think, too, like, did the person not like the book because it's just not their kind of book, or, like, really, it's just not, it's not their cup of tea, or do they have some really good feedback that you need to change? Uh, when I first wrote Between Boyfriends, I finished it in 2005, sent it out to a bunch of agents, and got back a bunch of feedback. And it was good and it was bad. And, of course, it was the negative feedback that helped me the most. I did a major rewrite over the next, like, two years and came up with a much, much, much better book thanks to them taking the time to tell me what could be improved. So um, I definitely... Still, I mean, I'm never going to be perfect. I definitely want my feedback. But sometimes you have to be discerning if somebody, you know, says, oh, this is this is totally unbelievable. And you're like, really? Because I based it on true events. So that's the kind of feedback you might want to just say, eh, okay, that, that's, that's not the most helpful. So my next question is for both of you. It's kind of this awkward question I like posing because I haven't found out the best way to answer it or ask it yet, but it's about writer's blog. What do you do when you hit that wall and you just can't write anymore? You're halfway, partially way through a story, and it just stops. How do you... For go, me personally, yeah. when I get to that point, I just walk away. I walk away and I stay away from the book. Um, I think we all have talked about this. Authors talk about this all the time because we have mm -hmm. going um, all of social media and we connect daily, and we just walk away from the book, stay three, four weeks away, and you'd be surprised that when you come back, you're ready to write. That's for me. Yeah, and I've never, I've never really had writer's block. Not really. I've gotten to a point where I was just too tired to keep writing, because sometimes I just get in the flow, and I'm just up really, really, really late writing, and then, and then my brain just doesn't work anymore. And that's you know, that's not the same thing, but I've never really had writer's block. But what I've told people, because, of course, my authors, that happens to them all the time. It's normal. I mean, I'm weird because I haven't had it. But what I tell them to do is to just go back and read what they've written. Just enjoy it. Just don't even think about writing. Just read. Even go back a book if you're in a series and just start reading again. And usually that gets you back in that mode that you were in when you wrote it, and suddenly you've got all these new ideas, and you just can't wait to start, start writing again. And that's helped a lot of people. I, it's not going to help everybody, but that's a strategy. And what Lillian said, too, taking off the pressure, walking away, focusing on something else, and then come back to it. That, that's also a great strategy. I usually get to that point when I am um, somewhere where I, I have like three or four different thoughts of which way I want to go, and I cannot make up my mind which one would be best. That is when I absolutely cannot think anymore. Right. I know how that goes. And that's a good time, too, to ask other people. Sometimes getting feedback from other authors mm -hmm. is to, to which way to go. Um, it can be can be so helpful, especially people, you know, that you've developed a relationship with and, and you really trust their judgment, that they really get your style and they really know what your stories are. I was actually just doing that this morning with one of my authors. She was writing a sequel to her bestseller, The Storms That Faded Us, and she was asking me, um, you know, what am I going to do? Like, I, I've got these characters and I'm not, I'm not sure which way I want to go. And out of the blue, like, I came up with something and she's like, oh, my God, I love that. And then from there we developed. It. And and that can be so helpful finding a beta reader or another author or you know someone that your publisher if you have an editor to just kind of say oh I'm not I'm not sure where I want to take this or or maybe I have too many options you know and your readers are, are always a great source of feedback I mean they're they're your fans they're the ones who sometimes know your characters better than you do and they can be a great resource when you're just not quite sure what comes next. That just sounds scary to me. The fans knowing your book better than you do. I just, I just can't. I've heard that line before, but it's still it's one it's one of those lines that I guess until I put the pen to paper and have something out there, I guess I well, I'm probably gonna write a story.
story about what I know more than a fiction story, but still. I um, think it, what it is, I think, is as an author, you no matter how much how real your characters become, they do they totally become real people. You still are in this process where you're still typing them into creation. For your readers, there there is no separation. They're just like the readers are real people. And so I think that's why sometimes they know them better than you do because they don't they don't have that that distance that you have to have as an author and a, an observer. You have to kind of observe yourself writing and so you you know that they're not completely real, but your readers don't don't have that distance. Mhm. Interesting. So, you know, the next fun question I like to ask some authors is, uh, would you like your books turned into movies, or a movie, or however that would flow? Yes. Of course, I certainly would. Yeah, and the other fun, the other, the other fun part of that, who who would you want starring in them? Oh, easy. <laughs> yeah, and? yeah I mean, that is pretty easy. Don't be busy. It's both of our choice. I, Ian Somerlander, I think, would be my choice for my main character, and then Christy Kirk for the girl. I think they would be perfect for my book. And it's funny because I think because Lillian's series is so long, I think it would be a great TV show. I mean, it could totally be the next Vampire Diaries, and which is really funny because of course that's what Ian Somerhalder's in. And um, they would, they, yeah. she, you know, she's right. They would be perfect for her books. I love Ashley Benson, um, Hannah from Pretty Little Liars. She would be a perfect Jan. And you know, because mine's a little shorter, I think a movie would be better. And I, I would love to see her in that. I mean, I would love to have Ian Somerhalder in it too, but, but my main character is Hispanic, and, and, and he is a great actor. I just don't know that he could quite pull off Hispanic. Yeah, you never know. I agree. We, we could always make things work, I'm sure. Now, for the right price, <laughs> anything could happen. Um, <laughs> so I, I noticed that you're both on uh, uh, Upgrade Your Story, but it, uh, let's see. Lillian, you're on in September, and CJ, you're on this week. Is that right? Yeah, Thursday I'll be on Upgrade Your Story with Allie Bishop. And I'm assuming she normally talks to authors then? Is that what her her racket yeah, is? Yeah, she has, she has three different shows, but Upgrade Your Story is, is definitely with authors. Yeah, this is the one I'm on uh, September. September is on 9th. I have the fourth wrote down, but that could be wrong. It could be a bad four, too. I can't remember. <laughs> it could be a bad four in my notebook. Who knows? <laughs> Those numbers tend to... Uh, I'm a terrible publicist. I don't remember. Well, it's in September. There's plenty of... No, it will, nobody will be listening to the show and be like, oh, I remember. Let me go find that show. Um, unless they're listening in September. Um, so, as you're going through these series... Do you have other ideas for books that you – what do you do with them once you get – if you have an idea that's totally not in line with what you're writing? Um, are you asking me, Jim? Yes. Yes. Well, I do have an idea, and actually, like I said, um, I did start another book. I'm a third into that book. Um, it's not uh, – and, and this is where I, I have – I steer away from what I did for the eight books. This book I'm writing is historic romance, and it's um, British Regency. So I have been doing a lot of uh, research and uh, spending a lot of time. That's why I have been only a third into that, and very frustrating but I'm going to do it. I understand that. I understand frustration. I get it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, CJ, what do you do when you... Yes. I have so many ideas, and I have about... You seem like that type of person. I just have to overstep you there for a second. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have, like, three different books that I've started, and, um, you know, it was really easy. 
easy when I had a series because when I would get other ideas, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to drop down the idea and I'm just going to put it aside because I'm finishing the series, you know? But now it's like, oh, okay, I have so much that I want to write. I have, um, I have a young adult fantasy novel that I'm working on. I have um, more sort of in the romantic comedy chiclet genre that I've already written. Uh, then I actually have a script that I'm working on. Who knows if I'll ever finish that. And that's also kind of a romantic comedy, too, that I've, that I've been sort of working on for several years now. So, I, I mean, I would, like, I don't really have a great answer for if you have a lot of ideas, what do you do? Except just, just drop them down, you know, never tell yourself, no, I don't have time for that right now, because you never know when you will have time. So jot them down, rem- you know, remember what you're going to do, maybe write a couple scenes if you feel really, you know, compelled to, and then... And then, you know, once you pick a project, though, just, just stick with that. And that that's worked for me. Me too. So I, I've, got to, I've got to wonder, since you have all these ideas in your mind, do you, how much coffee do you drink a day? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I live at Starbucks. I have an IV with ca- water, you know, caffeine sprayed in. No. But um, I drink a lot of coffee. Uh, sometimes I do switch to decaf, though. I have, you know, the lovely Starbucks gold card, so you can just get free refills on your iced coffee. It helps. I highly recommend it. <laughs> I, I would say, I guess so, if you're going to drink that much, yeah. Um, I just had to ask, because it just seemed, I, I was waiting for you to say, no, I don't drink coffee. What are you talking about? That was, that was what <laughs> was I was hoping for. Really, no, no, no. <laughs> there was something really funny I read recently where it was like, um, you know, everyone knows the story of Rumpelstiltskin. He turns straw into gold. And so someone had this quote I saw on Facebook where, you know, a writer is this magical creature that can turn caffeine into books. It's true. We're fueled by, by coffee and such. I like it. it is a good, it's a good analogy. I like it. So Yeah, I wish I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other thing that I wanted to bring out. How important is it for an author to blog or... Yeah, blog, I guess, because that's putting their message out. I mean, you've got social media and all that other stuff, but. I harass my authors about blogging, and then I don't do it myself. Like, it's totally a do what I say, not as I do situation. Blogging is incredibly important for an author, unless you already have a huge established fan base. That is how especially self-published authors start to build an audience. And I tell people, you know, at least, at least blog once a week. And if you do it only once a week, try to do it on the same day so that your followers know when to expect new content. But more is always better. Blogging, it's quick, it's fun, um, it's, it's contemporary. People really relate to that. And it's very easy to share it on social media. And people can ask you questions. It's really interactive. We comment on your blog and contact you. It's, it's one of the best, best, best ways to grow your fan base because people are willing to take a chance reading a free blog more so necessarily than they're going to go and just buy a book from someone they've never heard of. And then they start to know your writing and then they start to know you personally and then they really want to read your books. Did you just say blogging was fun? I need to go to Starbucks. I think they must be putting something in your coffee. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Why do you think so many people come back? They totally put something in the coffee. They <laughs> makes everything fun. <laughs> Maybe you're just blogging about the wrong things. I don't know. I have no time to do that. Honestly, I I am drowning with all the things that I have to do, trying to find time to write, staying up until 1 in the morning, a full-time job, and social media. I'm involved in so many things. I, I just absolutely have no time to blog. I just heard it was very important, so you might want to get on that. Oh, it is very important, but some people yeah, don't have time. I do. I do. I do. I harass them. I want to say harass. I'm not kidding. I harass my authors to do it. She tells me daily. See? This whole but thing you know, just one, one on you. Trick, <laughs> now it's turned one into- trick you can do, though, is, is guest posts. If you don't have time to blog, if you have some, some people who do guest posts or guest reviews, at least then you can get some content on there. And, and as long as you're finding people who, you know, write about your topic and, and maybe have a, a similar viewpoint, that's a really good way to, to get content on there when you don't have time to write every week. 
And I want to throw this out to you since you're kind of a publicist and you have and probably gonna, other authors are going to pick the show up and listen to it tonight. I, I tweet out a link every so often. I'll get it. I'll send it to an email. I'll send it to you in an email as well. But I, I put a book of the week in my newsletter, and I, I have been trying to get people to send me their book instead of me just going on Amazon and picking one at random from whoever. Like so. Yes, yeah, so just, just send it over, and I'll file it in my email, and then I'll tell you when I post it as part of the, the newsletter as well. Yeah, so. Aerial Mortal Awakening will be your next one. Between Boyfriends will be the one after that. <laughs> I've got eight more I can recommend for you, no problem. I'll send you whatever you need. But um, And then after that, after you get all of my authors, then all you've got to do is put something on social media or put something on your website saying, you know, send me your book of the month, and you will get like a thousand responses, and then you're going to have to close haven't. it because I haven't. I've been tweeting it for a week <laughs> now, and I've got two, and I've got a bunch of people that have retweeted it. You know, authors that have books, they've retweeted it and didn't take the time to send me the message. Put it in um, a, a Facebook group for authors, and they will jump on that. Well, it's not, probably I'm, just not getting seen by the right people. If you haven't noticed, I'm not exactly an author, and I'm not exactly even close. <laughs> okay, let me put it that way. If you put all of my clients' books in there, I will post something for you in some groups afterwards, and I promise I will give you some I'll, more people. I'll, I'll help you if you help me. I, that's, all, that's what I'll say. Perfect. Obviously, you should well, know that by now. you didn't know you were going to get a deal tonight, <laughs> did you? <laughs> so I am always looking for opportunities. <laughs> so well, great. My 160 news. 160, I think it is. I didn't check today, but newsletter subscribers are looking forward to it, plus the people that should be signing up, because next week I'm giving away some swag to somebody that's on the newsletter list. Hint, hint, for anybody that isn't on there. Anyways. There you go. <laughs> so, Lillian, tell me what... Well, and, uh, what well, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just, you know, I saw an opportunity for a plug. Um, J.P. Summers, The Storm That Dated Us, is free on Amazon right now. If people are listening, thinking, I don't want to wait till next week. I want free stuff now. Go get that. It's amazing. There you go. See, I'm giving free stuff away tonight to everybody. Anybody that listens yeah. can go get that. It, see? It's all good. So, okay. Oh, boy. Lillian, um, hit me if where people can find your book and where people can find you. Well, they can find me on my website which is um, www.lillianroberts.com. And um, um, I'm on Amazon. Uh, Amazon US, UK, Barnes & Noble. If they put in my name, my books will come up. I want to thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having us. <laughs> So, SJ, where can people find you? I mean, besides if they can ever spell well, your name right, um, or pronounce it right, but that's here and there. <laughs> that's fine. Ericajohnay.com, um, SJPublicity.com, that's my publicity site. I have a blog, BetweenBoyfriends.com. There's a hyphen, though, BetweenBoyfriends.com. That's my blog. I'm on Facebook. So is Lillian. Uh, we're both on Twitter. I'm at Ericajohnay and then at SJPublicity9. She's at Lillian Three Roberts. So there are a lot of ways, and both of our books are on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and iTunes. So people forget iTunes has an ebook store, and they can find her on Starbucks. <laughs> yes, and I'm always in Starbucks. <laughs> if you want to come see me in person, wander around San Diego, hit all the Starbucks, you will find me. <laughs> if you need that book signed, there you go. Go to Starbucks. Well, I want to thank you yep, for joining me tonight. And... <laughs> All Thank right, ladies. You. Thank you. This is that point of the show I was talking to you about earlier. So have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Good night. You too. So I want to thank them both for jumping on. And, and it was different having two guests in a different dynamic. And it leads to some different conversations, which is good. So I want to thank them both again. And I'll get all that information as part of the podcast. If you need a link, I can do that for you. Okay. Don't forget to visit SpectreState.com and check out their IR boosters and follow them on Twitter at AU Paranormal. My final thought tonight is going to be a little different than normal. I'm Well, not really. I'm just kidding. My final thought tonight is I, I was posed a question this afternoon on Facebook. It wasn't really posed to me. It was kind of a statement, but I'm going to pose it to you as a question. 
my group investigates twice a month. How are they reviewing all of the data they say they're collecting? If they're collecting 12 cameras at 12 hours with what? Who knows how many recorders? Let's, we'll just say 12 for the, you know keep the numerology going. That's 144 hours of video, 144 hours of audio. Okay, so that's uh, 288 hours of uh, video or audio to go over. So that's what? 10, nah, da, 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 doing the math here, 12 days worth of stuff of hours of audio and video to go over, and they're doing it in two weeks, which is just the shade under that. Boy, I I'm I'm just did the math here, and that gives you two days off, which is cool. So you can get ready and go back out and investigate again, eh? What's the rush? Why are... what? I mean, I know there's so many people out there that are so excited to get that belt loop that says, hey, we've been to X, Y, Z, and D. But if you're not doing the a quality job investigating, what's the point? If you have 700 investigations but you never have done a complete thorough job reviewing, what's the point of doing that many investigations over and over again? I don't know. That's what I'm asking you. Maybe somebody out there can explain to me what's the point of having a large quantity of investigations over a quality investigation. I know nobody will be able to convince me that doing 700 investigations in a year, or I oh, know that's a bit exaggerated, or 100 investigations a year is good idea. But you can try at italkparanormal at Gmail or italkparanormal on Twitter or italkfacebook.com slash italkparanormal. That's what you can do. You can, well, convince me. It shouldn't be that difficult. You're the one doing it. You have the, the methodology of doing it down, right? So you can share that with me. I mean, if you have 40 members, this 12, this 12 hour, 12 day thing kind of goes away, right? So it gets spread out, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe it is a good idea. What do I know? I'm just thinking that running out and investigating and not doing. I mean, okay. Here's the other thing. Who's doing the lead into that stuff? The the research about the property and the homeowners and all that fun stuff. Or are you just playing, playing to play, to get that number so high? So there's a lot of questions pre and post. I mean, I'm sure the investigation's fine because that takes you 12 hours or whatever the number is that you've spent investigating. So I'm sure that goes fine. Hey, gang, I'm out of time. Talk to you next week. Well, before we flip that on-air sign to the off position, a quick reminder. For all things about the report, previews, and reviews, go to italkparanormal.com. That's italkparanormal.com. Good night. If you're looking for a radio show where all things paranormal go, well, tune in and be in the know with Jim Mallard as your host. Come and see what lies beneath paranormal activity. The Mallard Report. Yeah, the Mallard Report. Get connected with Take Two Radio on Facebook or Twitter at Take Two Radio. For email updates on future shows, follow at Blog Talk Radio. For previous episodes, upcoming guests, and more, visit TakeTwoRadio.com.